I went into, uh, well, I was drafted. I tried to volunteer, but I couldn't volunteer because at that time I wasn't an American citizen. I'd been born in Canada and came down here when I was two years old, but my parents never took out citizenship until it was too late for me, so I had to do it myself. But I was drafted in, uh, into anti-aircraft and uh, went to California. I became a private, obviously, private first class, then a corporal, and went in California. And from there, I applied for officer's candidate school and was sent back to North Carolina to be uh, spent in uh, officer's training school and graduated as a second lieutenant. Then uh, later on in uh, Normandy, I was promoted to the first lieutenant and later on at the end of the war, I was a captain. All of us felt, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody felt the same, that uh, confidence of youth, you know, uh, they can't hurt me. I wasn't really scared except one time, the only time I was really scared to, to death uh, was during the Battle of the Bulge, and I was right in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, I was in my Jeep with my Jeep, I was liaison officer, I'll go into that later. I was in my Jeep with my driver, was stopped on uh, uh, the side of a ridge, and up, uh, uh, we're looking, wondering which way to go. And uh, we heard a noise up here, and I looked up, and there was a, saw the, uh, the barrel of a German tank gun coming up over the hill. It was a German Tiger tank, their biggest tank. And that, uh, about, oh, no more than probably 50, 60, 70 feet away. And that cannon was pointing right down at us, and I thought, uh oh, we're dead. And uh, it, he looked at us for about, oh, I'd say about maybe 30 seconds. Then slowly the, the gun moved away and the tank took off, went in that direction. Well, obviously I went in that direction. I think the only reason he didn't shoot was because by that time, it was the, bul the bulge had been going on for about three or four weeks and I know that they were short of gasoline, short of supplies, short of ammunition. And I, they probably said uh, inside the tank, it's not worth wasting a, a shell which we don't have many of on one single jeep. Let's wait till we find a truckload of soldiers or something. I think that's the only reason thing to save me, but that's the only time I can remember. I was really, truly scared. That would scare anybody. <laughs> this was, again, during the same uh, period. The, uh, the Germans hit the Battle of the Bulge on December 16th. They aiming at the town of Bastogne. And uh, I was liaison to 8th Corps headquarters, which was in the town of Bastogne. And, uh, <coughs> and this was when the Germans, the ball started on December 16th. The 101st Airborne came into the town to defend the town, which they did throughout the rest of the Battle of the Bowls, and we were told to get out. And uh, so uh, we were on the road all the time. On like Christmas Day, uh, my driver and I were going by a, a beat up old farmhouse and uh, <clears throat> it looked like the pirate was still standing, had been hit by sh shells or artillery or whatever. So we stopped and uh, pulled the Jeep up and, and they, they had a barn there and luckily the, gra the barn door was lying in the ground. So we put the Jeep inside the barn and put the door up in front of it, luckily so, because it wasn't seen from the road. Uh, lucky we thought of that, as you'll see later. We were inside, went inside, and, and we were gathering some hucks of wood. There's no wood stove in the kitchen. And we we're going to heat up our K-rations, because we'd been eating cold k rations, which is a pretty bad diet. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we hadn't started the fire yet. We noticed uh, in back of the stove is a a rope with a handle on it, and lift up, there's a trap door going into a root cellar underneath. And uh, so it was, it was interesting, so we just closed it. And, and suddenly we, we heard some noise out front, and a German staff car was pulling up in front of the place, followed by a German personnel carrier. They started coming out of the, uh, jumping out there, coming, they had the same idea we did. And they did have two or three American soldiers with them, prisoners. And uh, so 
We lifted up the trap door and Curly, my driver, jumped in. We swept all the food in there, too. And I was about to jump in, too. And I saw over in the corner of the room, I'd lean my Tommy gun in the corner of the room. <laughs> now, uh oh, if they see that, they'll know something's wrong. So uh, I uh, said, so hold it open. So I grabbed my Tommy gun, just dove head first in there and just slammed it around me just in time. So we were there for the rest of the afternoon, cold and wet, absolutely dark, and sitting in mud and uh, eating our cold K rations. While upstairs they're having a party. We could hear them singing and uh, drinking, having a real party, Christmas party. We were considered opening up the trap door and just throwing up, a, we had hand grenades. We also had hand grenades with us, throwing a couple of hand grenades up. But the only reason we didn't was because there were American soldiers probably we could kill too. So we didn't. Well, the first was in, uh, yeah, I was a liaison officer. Let me explain a little bit. <clears throat> the Army was built up in the old triangular, what they call the triangular setup. You had an Army, one Army with three Army Corps under, under the Army. Each Corps would normally have three divisions. and. Uh, this was the ideal setup on paper. It never worked that way. Sometimes one army would have three or four corps, and one corps might have six divisions. And uh, each division, uh, of course, had its own anti-aircraft battery. Uh, the armored divisions had half-track, and uh, the regular infantry divisions had uh, stationary anti-aircraft guns. My job was liaison between my own which is a group headquarters permanently assigned to the 8th Corps. My job was liaison from my own headquarters to the uh, Corps headquarters, which is further back. Oh, I was a mile or two back. And from my own outfit down to the divisions up and down the line. So I was traveling up and down the, the, the line a lot and back and forth to the line. Let's talk about the front line. So. My day, the greatest danger to me normally was snipers because early in the war, if we uh, uh, advanced and the Germans, uh, German soldiers were uh, bypassed, they'd try to fight their way back. Uh, later on, later in the war, they'd be happy to surrender. But at that point, <clears throat> at that point, they weren't. So anyway, in Normandy, I got hit by a sniper. Uh, the helmet, remember the shape of the helmet in the front curves down like that? Well, the bullet hit the, uh, just uh, exactly in the right curve. It went through and up and creased my skull about, oh, maybe an inch, inch and a half scar on the front of my skull and out the top of the helmet. And a good souvenir, I saved the helmet for a long time. And uh, it uh, gave me two beautiful black eyes because the helmet slapped down when it was hit. <laughs> I had the most, two beautiful black eyes here, so. But, uh, we didn't, things like that, there was a minor. Uh, I just it bled a lot, but I just wiped it, you know, and stuck a rag on it, put the helmet back on. You only get a Purple Heart if you report to the medics and get medical treatment. Then they will write you up for a Purple Heart. So that one I never reported, so nothing happened. Uh, later on in Germany, more or less the same thing. I uh, was hit, was in a, in a small town, was town of house to house fighting type of stuff. And um, a piece of shrapnel got me in my left eye, just like that, right in the, the corner, and dug into the, the wall right that, that I was standing next to. And uh, <clears throat> my eye filled up with blood, obviously. So I thought, uh oh, I've lost my eye. But I saw this piece of shrapnel sticking in the wall. But, so I'll get, the, I'll get a souvenir of what took my eye out. So I grabbed it, and that thing was red hot. Ooh, it burned my hand. <laughs> That's other, that was the worst uh, pain I got from that experience, was burned hand. But again, it was just a little tick of the, uh, so I wiped it off and blinked a few times, you know, so I didn't report that. But later on in, uh, in Germany, we're crossing the Rhine River, <coughs> and there was a, a ditch uh, all the way along the, uh, along the way, along the edge of the river. And we were lying in the ditch, waiting for the word to go across. And the Germans were firing, uh, they had a terrific weapon, the 20 millimeter Ehrlichan, it was called, 
20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, four barrels, and, and they, could, they could lower it for ground fire. Every round was what's called a tracer. You could see it coming just like a, a, a fireworks just in the 4th of July. You could see the things going up. Well, every round was coming over, and they're all just going overhead, all up and down. Though naturally, we kept our head down. And, uh, the, uh, but some German guy was too smart for, for, for us. I saw some German up there remembered probably that there's a ditch over there. Why, why are we shooting over the top of the ditch? Let's, so he, uh, I could see the line of fire come down, I guess, right down toward me, down the ditch. And uh-oh, so I, my driver, my Jeep driver and I are both there, so I nudged him. Hey, curl up. So we, we both curled up to make as small a target as possible. And uh, <clears throat> one round uh, landed right between his feet and my head, and it got shrapnel up the, uh, up the arm. But there I had to report, to, because they'd pull the shrapnel out. So there I got the purple hat for. When uh, we found a concentration camp, yeah. I think, as far as I know, my driver and I were the first Americans to actually find, we had heard there were such things, but to find one. This is uh, shortly before the end of the war. Things were very flexible. The Germans had scattered. They were taken off. And uh, so we were driving in my Jeep, uh, my driver and myself. We came across, <clears throat> there was a big chain link fence, big gates open. The fence must be about eight or 10 feet high, and uh, which, with a barbed wire all the way around the top. And a gallows right inside the gate, a gallows with a, uh, either three or four, I'm, I'm picturing them around, I forget whether three or four bodies hanging from the gallows. What the heck is this? So we went in, there was a big building inside there, one great big building, oh, the size of a football field probably. The door was open and we uh, went up, we looked inside the door and there were, it was probably about twice the width of this room, but as long as a, oh, I'd say a football field long. Uh, and it was stacked with bodies, all naked bodies, stacked up from floor to ceiling. And they had white powder on them. I was told this was lime or lye, which would help decompose them. I don't know. But anyway, we went back and we told, uh, we immediately went back and told my colonel. He got on the phone and told everybody. And the next day, General Eisenhower, Eisenhower was down there, all his staff and the old news reporters and everything else, camera uh, camera crews, and uh, I just, we went down there too, and just uh, around the outskirts while they were uh, taking pictures of this, and uh, this was pretty widely reported back in the States. This was uh, a small one. You never heard of, you hear of the big ones like uh, 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 Baden-Baden, uh, Buchenwald, and so forth, Auschwitz. This was Ordruf, O-H-R-D-R-U-F. And uh, that was the first one. That, and the, so that got quite a lot of write-up because it was the first, concentr pr first proof of a concentration camp that the Americans had. The Germans, because the Americans were coming, they just left everything they took off, luckily for them. But they ran across a lot of interesting figures. Uh, in, uh, I met him, and I saw him, I never was, uh, we never had anything to do with the military. He was General, General Teddy Roosevelt. He was the son of uh, the original president, Theodore Roosevelt, and a distant cousin of um, Franklin, D Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he became famous because uh, like in the, he was in the invasion in Omaha Beach, which was a tough one. And uh, <clears throat> he was on the beach walking up and down, didn't wear a helmet, just had a walking stick. And uh, walking up and down the beach, uh, encouraging the boys, and, you know, hey, duck down there, son, you're going to get hit. And he just walked without a helmet on. And uh, oh, they, they loved him. And uh, another general, he got, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor for his 
actions at the invasion. Another general, this is something that uh, they gave us back to Patton. <coughs> the 79th Division was a good division, infantry division, and we are with them quite a lot. And uh, it was commanded by a general named Weich, W-Y-C-H-E, Sam Weich. And uh, he was generally considered the best, or one of the best division commanders in Europe. And he spoke with a, I got to know very, I got to know him fairly well on an impersonal basis. You know, I got uh, doing business with him. He had a high, squeaky voice. And uh, one time, uh, we were uh, in uh, Germany. Oh, it might have been in France, I forget. But anyway, I forget where exactly. But uh, orders have been issued for an attack and the attack was going nowhere. And uh, the Germans were too strong, so we'd attack and nothing would be accomplished. And uh, <clears throat> so one night, uh, I went back to, I had to go back to Corps, 8th Corps headquarters, and I uh, dug a foxhole for myself. And then they put up, uh, they'd, the headquarters was composed of tents. They put up what's called a situation tent, the G3, the operations tent, right next to my foxhole. And they had a big meeting in there that night with Patton and the, Troy, the Corps commander, Troy Middleton, the ma major general. He was a good general. And Sam Weish, the, uh, the this commander of the 79th Division I'm talking about. And the show is Patton, again. He was demanding, how come you aren't going forward? We give the order, you go forward, you go forward. And uh, Weish said, well, General, if, uh, if we had the artillery that we requested, we'd be able to go forward. The, the Germans have a heavy concentration of mortar fire, mortars in front of us. We start to go forward, uh, and the mortars kill us. We have to, we have to dig in. And he was, he was in his high, uh, General, what do you have? His high, squeaky voice. And I still remember Patton is saying, which is true, anybody with any infantry knowledge knows that you can't advance in the face of mortar fire. Mortars are so accurate. More, I've known mortar fire uh, soldiers who would, they would brag that they could, a mortar goes up like that. They could put one down a chimney at 200 yards or, or into a rain barrel a quarter of a mile away. They aren't that good, but they're pretty close to it. But they're so accurate that you go forward in the face of a heavy mortar fire, you're gonna get killed. And all you can do is dig in and call for your artillery, hey, get, wipe out those mortars out there. Let us go forward. So uh, that's what General Weiss said. So we've got to dig in, General. We have to dig in. We, uh, you haven't given us up the artillery we asked for. And Patton said, dig in. God damn it. You dig in and you die. And there was dead silence all through the tent. Uh, everybody knew. If you don't dig in, you die. You dig in, you have to dig in. Again, it showed how much practical or tactical knowledge General Patton had of the normal operations. And uh, I know I keep harping on Patton, but, <laughs> but it's true. I didn't think much of him. And the people who were really exposed to him didn't either. His troops, the ones who were the riflemen and so forth, they had the glamour of being in the Third Army, General Patton's soldiers. And uh, it was they, uh, a lot of men loved him because uh, just like MacArthur's over there, they loved MacArthur. But uh, anybody knew Patton, he's, a lot of guys died unnecessarily because uh, Patton didn't know what he was doing. I, uh, I'll probably hurt the feelings of a lot of people who uh, worship General Patton, but I never thought much from him, either as a man or as an officer. And most of the officers who had dealings with him uh, felt the same. My own op private opinion was that he was the result of the need that the American public had for a hero. Uh, out in the Pacific, they had MacArthur uh, with his uh, pork pie hat and his uh, corn cob pipe. And Patton, on the other side, 
was the John Wayne type with the pearl handle revolvers. I don't think he ever shot them, but uh, he had wearing pearl handle revolvers and the cavalry pants and a loud, boisterous, profane, very profane type of guy. And uh, if, re if you read books written, uh, there's a book that's written by General Bradley, or another one Eisenhower wrote, and I've read these books. And when they talk about uh, Patton, generally they kind of downplay it, but you can see that Patton was sort of forced upon them. They had to use him for the sake of the uh, Defense Department, for the sake of the public, and so forth. But you can see that their attitude was the same as mine. The, uh, we were, uh, Patton was the Third Army, and the Eighth Corps was assigned to the Third Army. And uh, so we are occasionally, when we are in the Third Army, then we'd see Patton. Now, as I said, my job was liaison from my own outfit up to Corps headquarters. And at one, t one time, uh, Patton had issued orders, believe it or not. Everybody in the Third Army at all times will wear neckties. Even infantry, infantrymen on the front lines had, oh, and had the sleeves rolled down, no rolling up the sleeves. Uh, and wear neckties. Imagine wearing a necktie in combat, firing your rifle. Uh, and officers will display, I mean, will wear uh, their brass, which we call the, the decorations, you know, the, the insignia. Now, in my type of job, on the road all the time, I also my collar turned inside out, so I have my, my brass on the collar, but it turned under so it wouldn't show. Otherwise, you're, an, uh, being an officer, you're a natural target for any sniper in the works, <coughs> any sniper in the world. So one time I was up at Corps headquarters and get out of my Jeep. We were walking toward the uh, operations tent. I saw Patton coming toward me and I snapped a salute at him and he uh, looked at me and said, oh, uh, yo, what's your name? I told him, uh, that time I was a lieutenant, first lieutenant if I remember right. Uh, lieutenant O'Brien, sir, you're off under the 13 triple land aircraft, sir. Uh, uh, something about you know, making a habit of ignoring Army regulations? No, sir. I follow regulations to the best of my best, uh, my best uh, ability. Uh, are you aware of the order ordering you to wear a necktie? Uh, yes, sir. Well, you're in violation of, of uh, uh, Army regulation, Army order. No, sir. If the general will observe, I have, I have my necktie tied around my belt. And, <laughs> and uh, through the loops, and uh, uh, where's your brass? Where's your insignia? I said, here it is, sir, and I turned it out. Aren't you aware the orders are that you will display your brass? No, sir, if the general will read his own order, you will see that your, the general's own order was to, to wear a necktie, not to wear it around his neck, and to wear insignia, not to display it. And if the general observes, sir, I'm wearing a necktie and I'm wearing my brass. Were you a wise guy? No, sir. <laughs> he took off. He didn't like me. I didn't like him. <laughs> Stupid regulations. He, that was only one illustration of what uh, he, uh, various times would do. Ironically, when the war was over, I had caught, I was in Heidelberg waiting to be shipped back to the States. And I caught, believe it or not, infectious mononucleosis. And uh, so I was in the uh, Army Hospital in Heidelberg, and I had a private room. And they, wouldn't, they won't discharge you with half a degree of temperature. They won't discharge you. So I was in there for weeks. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, in my own little kingdom, in my own private room in the hospital. And one day in the, uh, oh, in the middle of the night, the sergeant, I mean, the, the captain of the nurses, the head nurse came in and woke me, shook me. Oh, Brian, oh, Brian, wake up. Patton was here. I still remember. I said, oh, what do I care? Send somebody out and salute him. And uh, so she took off. And about a little while later, I often went back to sleep. A little while later, uh, my own nurse came in. Hey, oh, Brian, wake up. We got to move you out of here. What? Yep, Patton was in an automobile accident. He's been hurt bad. He's, we got to put him in a private room, and yours is the only room available. So they moved me back in the ward, and well, he had the private room, and uh, he died 
in that room because apparently he, he fractured something in the cervical uh, spinal cord. And um, apparently that's the type of thing they don't recover from, at least in those days. And so he died, ironically, in my bed. And it was big news when Patton died. We, uh, we had problems all through the winter of the bulge because nowhere, uh, at no time do we have the proper uh, clothing or equipment for that kind of weather. It, was, it ha happened to be the first winter that uh, they had seen over in that part of the country in tw something like 25 or 30 years. Snow up to your knees, uh, something like winter we had last year over here, but much worse. And for that, <clears throat> for three nights uh, in that winter, I slept indoors. By indoors, I don't mean sleeping in a hotel or something. You find an old farmhouse or a barn you, uh, that you get in and felt safe to sleep. Otherwise, uh, digging a foxhole and uh, pulling, a, uh, <clears throat> pulling canvas over yourself. We didn't have sleeping bags, so we had a, a pup tent, uh, what they call shelter halves, two of them and uh, lay, make a, a steeping bag out of that. I invented, I was written up for, uh, in the Stars and Stripes was a newspaper that was published uh, every week, if I remember right, all throughout Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it was distributed too, and they had reporters going, taking down whatever information they could. And I invented something that was written up in the Stars and Stripes. One time we are in a spot where we're, we knew we were going to be there for a few days. So I dug my foxhole extra big and extra deep. I lined it with canvas. Then I found a, a, a five-gallon gas can, empty gas can, and cut a little hole in the bottom and the, and the top where you open it up to pour gas out. I took a half a dozen sea ration cans. A sea ration was about the size of a Campbell's soup can and cut the top and the bottom off them and uh, fit them inside each other, sort of make a chimney. I put, the, I put that on top of the five-gallon gas can and uh, I would take a bunch of handful of small twigs and everything, light them and stick them, stick them in there, make a little, little furnace for myself. And uh, this was a chimney right out of my foxhole. and had the foxhole lined with a canvas and canvas over the top, so if it snowed during the night, then uh, it wouldn't get snowed on. And uh, it was pretty good. It lasted for about five days since we had a move and I had to throw, throw the whole thing away. But somebody reported it was seen, and, uh, and they took pictures of it. It was written up in the Stars and Stripes that uh, my adventure for the deluxe fo type foxhole. Un unfortunately, that, that uh, that can be exaggerated. I enjoyed it more, or appreciated it more in the trip I took later on, in 1991, I think it was, when I went back there. Because the trouble is, uh, we were all too young to really appreciate what we were seeing. Now, for instance, uh, at right at the corner of coming down Normandy, going up into Brittany, uh, is uh, Mont Saint Michel. It's a, uh, a monument out in the, out in the ocean. And with a causeway, you can go out to it and at high tide. At that time, the high tide would be covered. So uh, it was a complete island. It was uh, built as a monument to St. Michael, the archangel. And looking at it from a distance, it looked like uh, Disneyland, the picture you see of Disneyland with its spires going up, you know. Beautiful looking thing. So we went through it. We saw it as a... Uh, when you're first going through there uh, during the war, so I thought, oh, geez, isn't that something? And, uh, but when I was over there again, then I went through there and went, out, went in and went all the way up the top and took pictures all over the place and much were, were able to uh, appreciate it. Um, when we first, when I was first over there, we went from, Fran from 
went up uh, Normandy up into Brittany, then from there all the way across uh, Europe to Belgium toward Bastogne, and it went through Paris. But Paris at that time to us was just, just another big city. Where when I went back there in 91, we spent uh, oh, almost two weeks. And uh, then I was able to appreciate Paris. I saw museums and uh, historic parts of Paris. But the trouble is, when you're there first, you're too young. You don't realize the significance of what you're seeing. So it's worthwhile 